Welcome. You are listening to the Be A Better Being podcast hosted by Michelle Zellner and Sasha Bershide. Michelle and Sasha are here to give you information and inspiration to help you live your healthiest, happiest lives. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy the show. Greetings. Thank you for tuning in to the Be A Better Being podcast. I'm Michelle Zellner, your host, and you are in for such a treat today because my guest is going to blow you away with all of the amazing insight he's going to bring kind of in the topic of men's health, but that's kind of the broad topic. We're going to see where the conversation takes us. Cody Jones, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. I know it's going to be a great conversation for sure. Yeah. So I always think my guests do a much better job of introducing themselves than I do. So let's give the listeners a little bit about you, who you are, where you're from, and what brought you to uh, doing what you're doing today. Sure. Yes. So, so I am, I always say I'm a fitness advocate, entrepreneur, or personal growth enthusiast. I know that encompasses a lot of things. It's a very big umbrella and we can dive into that to whatever extent you want to do. I am from the Southeast United States, as you can probably tell South Carolina specifically, you know, yeah, I was, I I became an entrepreneur. If, if becoming an entrepreneur is a thing, there's a debate on whether you're born or made into an entrepreneur, but I myself started started my entrepreneurial journey at 20. I started my business at 20, right before I turned 21. So I just turned 31, so a decade into this thing. I've learned a lot over the past decade, not just about the business that I'm in, but also about myself, how to interact with other people, You know how I come across to other people, which is a, actually a big thing that I think we all need to be aware of. Around 25, I, I lost my mom. My mom died around 25, so there was a big shift in my life then. Throughout my 20s, had you know a couple of serious relationships that were not really good. Learned a lot about myself and also relationships through those. Somewhere around late 20s, 28, 27-ish, I uh, started the whole fitness journey. So I learned a lot through there. So you know, my 20s, I feel like they probably could have been busier than they were, but certainly busy. I was busy in my 20s. I, I was I was always doing something and still still doing something to this day. You know, so so I, I'm not sure if that was a intro or not. I know kind of jumping around there. I love it. I love it. So you are 20 years younger than I am, which is, I love talking to younger millennials. You're still a millennial, right? You're not Gen, you're not Gen Z. Uh, 93. I'm not sure what the cutoff is. Okay. I, I guess maybe, maybe I was I think, right there on the beginning of millennials. Yeah, I think or... you're on the cusp. Yeah. I love it. This is so fantastic. So let's first talk about what business did you start? Is it the same business you're in? Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I started, I started a landscaping business and, you know, when I was 20 years old, I'm not really sure what I tell people is I just could not, I felt suffocated working at a company. You know, I just could not breathe going to a company. And I kind of felt bad at the time because I've worked at, you know, big for big companies, warehousing and manufacturing, this kind of thing. The people around me thought that this was a good opportunity. And it it made me kind of feel selfish because I'm like, you know, people are, are, would like to be in my shoes and the people that are in my shoes, they like these jobs. And so like, what's wrong with me? this kind of thing. And so, so yeah, but it was a landscaping company. It was something kind of knew something about, it's actually very simple to start a landscaping company. I mean, you know, a mower, a truck and a, and a, and a couple of pieces of equipment you're in business, but somewhere around 20, when I was 25, so somewhere around five years in business understood that commercial was, was sort of our, our focus. That was where I wanted to, you know, spend a lot of, a lot of our time. And so we still do a lot of commercial. Most of what we do actually is commercial is commercial maintenance. Um, so yeah, but to answer your question, that's, that's the business I'm still in currently, you know, 10, 10 years deep. Well, you know, you don't make it 10 years if you're not doing something right. So that's, that's fantastic. I hope, man. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I had the entrepreneurial spirit as well. Also with the landscaping company, when I was eight, we had what was called farm days, far, something farm days. I grew up in Wisconsin and our neighbor, our farm neighbor up the road was hosting it and they needed the plots for the vendors to be mowed. And we lived out in the Hmm. country. We mowed our lawns. My sister and I said, we'll do that. So we had our own little landscaping business for farm days, made a bucket load of money. But we also learned about taxes, about the Mm -hmm. cost of doing business, because of course my dad had to help us out. And, you know, we had to pay for the gas and we had to give him a cut because we had to understand that, you know, you wouldn't be able to do this job if it wasn't for me providing you things. So that's the whole learning about taxes, which amazingly, even people in their thirties have no idea Mm -hmm. where their money goes and how taxes work. So I'm sure you were self-taught. You learned a lot about that as you decided to start your company. Yeah. You know, I was going to say, unfortunately, but I don't think it's unfortunately 
depending on how you look at it, fortunately or unfortunately, most successful business owners learn most of what they learn through experience. You know, we talk about the education system and talk about, you know, the degrees and all this kind of thing. And there's a lot of things that just you simply will not learn unless you just get out in the in the battlefield, so to speak, and just get on the front lines and just just learn through experience. I mean, you know, but because because you're right. I mean, taxes, most of us, if we're not fortunate enough to have a a home where we learn these things or if our parents don't teach us these things, we just simply do not know until, you know, we're in trouble with the IRS and then it's, then it's a problem, you know? So, yeah, I mean, a lot of successful business owners, I think, learn through that experience. And I think there's a lot of things that we learn in life through experience. I mean, there's some things you can't, you know, some forms of adversity, you just simply cannot read about or talk to a person about. I mean, it's just that real, just that, just that raw experience, man. You know, yeah, which, I mean, always looking true. back, it's, it's hard to see it in the moment, but always looking back, those are some of the most valuable moments of our life, depending on how we handle it, you know. Well, I feel like you've come to that revelation at a very young age, especially for a man. And I, I don't want to, you know, generalize, but I'm going to because it's generally true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Men tend to not do that kind of self-reflection and take that opportunity for growth if they do, it is probably much later in life. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you grew up with in the home? Or is that something maybe losing your mom at a fairly young age kind of taught you? Tell me where, where that came from in you. So that's a really good question. You know, I'm going to answer this. And I don't want to answer it in a way that sounds disparaging towards my parents. I mean, I think that my parents were doing sort of the best they they knew how to do with the information they had at the time. I don't think there was you know any any faults or right or wrongs that were done there. But I think for, for me, for my personal situation, one of the best things that I had maybe working in my favor was that I was sort of forced to find out a lot of these things on my own. You know, I didn't really have a, again, I don't want to sound disparaging towards my parents, but it's not like I had a lot of cheerleading going on or a lot of, I, I talked to people my age and maybe even younger and maybe even older too, uh, see people that are older than me, they have this, this. I will say an issue because I think it is an issue. They had this issue or this problem of having to, you know, please their parents or this kind of thing. And, and you know, it's, it's taking this career route that, that maybe their parents want them to go or whatever. And so I do think that's an issue for people because I think a lot of times that's not really something that they themselves want to do, or at least this is my experience talking to these people. It's just not something that really fulfills them. They're just trying to, I guess, make their parents proud, which is a whole different conversation. I understand that. But, but no, I think, I think one of the things for me was that maybe you know, I didn't really have that blueprint to follow. So what I was, I, you know, I, I just think now that we're having this conversation, I just think back, like looking back in my early twenties, mid twenties, late twenties, even now, just listening to people like Tony Robbins and the Joe Rogan and his podcast, and just listening to these other people who were doing these, these, these amazing things. I mean, these, these men and women who were just achieving just, I mean, things like you wouldn't imagine, like David Goggins, who just, these people just doing incredible things, Elon Musk. And I think, I think it was, it was that it was sort of me having to, well, first of all, I put myself into business, which I didn't really, I, if, if you would have told, if I would have told, if I could go back to my 20 year old self and say, okay, you want to start a business. Okay. Well, we're going to see about that. Let's see. Cause you're going to have this happen. You're going to have this happen. You're going to have these challenges come in and we'll see how bad you really want it. Like, and so I had to just kind of put myself out there, man. And it was just either, you know, it, it the situation I was in, it was either, make it happen and succeed or, or, or lose what little bit you had at the time, you know? And there was no plan B, right? Exactly. I mean, it was like yeah. this, this, I was going to make this happen. And I don't know, man, it's, 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 it's looking back on this thing. It's really, it's almost inspiring to me to just be able to think about where I was at then, because because I, I, what I've been able to do, and you talked about the, the men's issues, and I completely agree with that, that a lot of guys do not have this revelation for whatever reason. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons, but one of the things I, I, that I really appreciate about this whole experience, the whole decade of what's been going on here, and that, that includes a, all the experiences, is that I'm able to look back on that and use that as fuel for now, for the next step, you know, for the next project. for, And also, too, you know, trying to help people who are in my, in my position. Um, Cause like I said, I was in a spot where I didn't really, man, a lot of what I did, especially in the earlier years, I was just kind of like, just, just, you know, just swinging for it. I mean, just, just, just trying to make it happen, trying to make the next thing. And then, you know, a lot of times it didn't happen, but then there was that one time that it did and it, it helped me get to the next spot and the next spot. And it's just like, man, it's just, but I understand that's not for everybody. So I, I can't, I, I don't expect or wouldn't recommend anybody to do it that way, but I'm not sure if that answered your question. I feel like I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. 
your tangents are fantastic. So you just keep doing you because honestly, you touch on so many things that I think are very relevant to everybody, no matter what age. And, you know, it, it's funny how the synergies happen. So I am an accidental entrepreneur as well. And back in my day, this wasn't a thing. So I started personal training almost 27 years ago now, which that's when like the Hollywood stars had personal trainers. It wasn't mm -hmm. a thing. And it was, I was just going to be a personal trainer forever because this is amazing. Why would I never not do this? Right? right. That's how you start out when you're 25. And my mom, who actually was the entrepreneur in our family said, well, honey, if after a few months you have to get a real job, you know, that's okay. Because it was such a foreign concept. I grew up in small town, Wisconsin. Here I am in Colorado, a very different environment, such a foreign concept that you're going to have people pay you to make them exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay, good luck with that, right? And yet, same, like I didn't have this master plan. It was, that mm -hmm. was going to be it. But opportunities open up and I find a different route. I find a new passion. I find a new thing. You say yes to a bunch of things. Some of them work out, some of them don't. And it's just understanding that you just keep moving forward. Somehow mm -hmm. you're open, you build your skills, you widen the net, you keep doing that. And eventually it will happen. It might not happen in the way you thought it would. Believe me, looking back, none of what's happened in my life. I predicted none of it. Zero. A hundred percent zero of it. <laughs> right. And yet here it is, right? So I think I, I wish I had the the perspective at 31 that you have at 31, I'm going to give myself a little bit of grace because we didn't have things like podcasts mm -hmm. and talking about all these things openly on social media. We didn't have those things. So right. I'm going to give myself a bit of a pass on that. Like this whole personal growth and development, that was not a thing when I was in my thirties. It has become much more of a mainstream thing now, which is why everybody just thinks it's always been a thing. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that is something that your generation has to its advantage because you do have access to all of these amazing, you know, stories of inspiration or guidance and ideas and ways to talk about different things to cast a super wide net versus, you know, prior to all this, this tiny little circle that I could maybe reach out to, but even in my world, nobody understood what I was doing. So just the, the message for your generation and male, female, it doesn't matter because when we're in the thick of life, it's really hard to see anything other than what's happening in your life, right? Mm -hmm. And yet when you've gone through experiences and probably most people, by the time they're 30, they've gone through at least one hard thing in life. Uh, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe it's, you know, losing a parent or a really difficult health situation. I think looking back on that and recognizing, yeah, these allowed me to develop tools and skills and perspectives that will carry me forward for my next situation. Mm -hmm. But it's a choice to look back and learn and see that, right? It's really easy to be mad about those hard things or upset or it's not fair and all the things. Yep. It's hard to do the work and then move forward. So did that just come naturally to you? Like, just, oh, I'm going to learn from it. Or did you struggle with the hard stuff and at some point realized maybe a different perspective will help me move forward? Hmm. And, and I asked that question because I think a lot of people have a perception that it's easy for some people, right? Mm -hmm. And and my guess is it, it wasn't easy for you. I know it wasn't easy for me. It was right. a lot of hard work. And and the reality is everybody can do the hard work yep. if they choose to. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree with that. I think I think it is easy for us, you know, especially like these very, very, very high achievers like the Elon Musk and, the, and, the, and these kind of guys. It's easy for us to put these guys on a pedestal. And this is something that I talk about a lot is, is that, you know, it, when you put these people on a pedestal, what you're saying to yourself subconsciously is that these people are capable of doing things that you are not capable of doing. And it's simply not true. It's simply not true. I mean, I can look, I just, I can think back over the last 10 years and you, you say, was it difficult? Were there times that were difficult? You know, was there times that, that I was maybe fearful or stressed or, you know, anxious or whatever. And it's, and it's like, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. There were, there were those times, but I don't exactly know what it was or where it came from that 
that that sort that form this mentality about this that I have. But it's like what I try to always tell people, and especially men, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I don't really speak a lot on women's issues. Women certainly have their issues, but I, I feel like me as a man, I am not in a position to speak to women about women's issues. I just feel like that's an obvious thing, but I do, I do talk to men about men's issues. And like one thing that I try to explain is that like embracing the struggle does so much for you, because if you're going to live, if you're going to live any kind of life of any sort of success or any sort of achievement or, or, you know, whatever, I just feel like 80% well, just think about a hero. 80% of any hero movie is the struggle because what, what else, what else are you going to do? You're going to have a, not, not have a struggle. And then what, what kind of life is that going to be? I mean, what, at the other end of that, if you're constantly running from things, constantly running from struggles or adversity or whatever, what kind of life are you going to build for yourself? And maybe you're okay with that, but I mean, you have to understand that there's, there is a life that comes with that and you might, that might not be the life that you want, but if you can embrace the struggle, if you can, if you can embrace the adversity, one of the big things that you do while doing that is that you teach yourself that you could overcome these things that you did not think you could ever, ever overcome. I speak a lot on, you know, building self-confidence and being building self-esteem and this kind of thing. And I think one of the ways to do that is that you keep the promises that you make to yourself. You know, if you tell yourself you're going to go to the gym X number of days per week and you do that, you do that over a long enough period of time, you can trust yourself. And that is, I think, by definition, what self-confidence is. But it's also too like when you when you come up against these things, when you come up against these struggles, these these adversities, it's like you have to have some sort of some sort of self identity with yourself because you have to know how you're going to respond when these things test you when this adversity comes. And it's like, I don't know how else you can do that if you don't put your if you're not in these situations to experience this, you know, because I mean, it, it's not about like, it's this is something I always tell guys too. it's not about just solving the problem. It's about being the person who can solve the problem, because those are two different things. If you just solve a problem, and you're just like, Oh, man, glad that's over. I can promise you something else is going to come along that's going to be another problem versus if you can focus on being the person who just handles the problems, who just handles the things, then that's just who you are. And then when these things happen, you're like, okay, well, this is something else. I got this. I'm going to, I'm going to get this. I'm going to move forward. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, and maybe it might be different from, from the woman's perspective. I don't know. I've actually never had a conversation with a woman about this because I usually talk to the men, because like I said, I think the men's issues and the women's issues that we have, I, I think there's a, there's a lot going on there, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I don't know where this, this, I think this mentality just got sort of, I think it was sort of like, I, you just had to have this, like I said, if you were going to, it was either succeed or basically or not or, you know, just make it or not. And I think you had to have this sort of to make it through. I don't, I don't know how else to, to phrase it other than that. Well, and I think that's such a great point. I was actually um, just on a girl's trip a couple weeks ago and my two friends have boys and one of them is uh, teenage years and having some issues and she recognizes is like she in part created it because mm -hmm. she and, and her, you know, her husband always took care of things. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we, we don't want our kids to suffer. We don't want our kids to struggle. We don't want our kids to have trouble or if they're in trouble, we'll we'll clean it up so that it doesn't cause a bigger issue for them. And the more you do that, you really are not allowing kids to develop their own skills to do that themselves. Yep. And I think we're kind of seeing that being played out where this entitled mentality for a lot of people, not everybody, mm -hmm. but. Entitlement, and I've heard that word, I can't tell you how many times in the last three weeks, from all different people of all different ages, all different socioeconomic statuses, all different phases of life, and they are seeing entitlement everywhere. Yep. And I think that entitlement, to some degree, comes from things just being given to them. We're just exactly. going to give it to you. We're going to give it to you. There's, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. There are no consequences at all, ever, for anything, right? Mm -hmm. And that is what ultimately now we end up maybe having some real challenges with when we become adults, because we have no coping skills, no problem solving skills. We are afraid of adversity. So we avoid it. We run away from it. We turn to a substance to make us, you know, get distracted from it for a while, whatever it is. We mm -hmm. blame somebody else for it. And I think these are universal, you know, man, men and women, we all do these things. I think men in their role because of now what society has decided that men are horrible right and i would love for you to kind of speak to that message because i think that's a topic as well they're kind of left with like okay well i'm not needed and i'm not valued 
and I'm like, you know, the worst thing on the planet. So why should I even bother trying anything? Hmm. How does, does that resonate with you at all? Yeah. So man, there's so much there. I think the first thing I would say is that, you know, I, I certainly agree with this, with the entitlement, the sense of entitlement and where that comes from, you know, who, who knows? I mean, and how we solve that, who knows? But th what I will say that is if you, and again, this speaking to men, as a man, if you feel entitled and you're going to do something like start a business or, you know, pursue a thing. And if you feel entitled and you expect this thing to be given to you, you're going to lose. Like that's just, that's what it comes down to because the world is so competitive, especially in business, especially, you know, with, there is not a job that you want. If you're a man and you're a heterosexual man, there is not a job that you want. There is not a woman that you think is attractive. There is not a lifestyle that you want for yourself that somebody does not simultaneously think the same thing about. And so if you feel entitled and you feel like these things are just going to be given to you just because you want it and you don't have to do anything to earn it, you're going to lose. That's just, that's what it boils down to. And then that's causes the resentment. And it's just, you know, some guys in those categories, not all, but some guys in those categories are pissed off at the guys who are like succeeding because they're actually putting in the effort and whatever. That's a whole different conversation. But yeah, it's, it's so competitive, man. And I don't see how, I don't see how you, I don't see how you can look at the world and think that it should be any other way. And now with saying that, I've, I want to say too, because I said this in the past, it is competitive and I agree with it being competitive. And I think that it should stay competitive. I mean, I don't know a way that we could not make it competitive, but I think it should stay competitive because what that means is if it's competitive and men are, you know, they're in business or whatever they're doing to compete for, for whatever the end goal is that well, I think that ensures that the person who is most capable at the job will get the job. If that makes sense, because if we're just, we're, if we're just freely giving out things to people, whoever wants it, like what, where, I mean, what's the likelihood that the person who actually gets that thing is going to be the person for that role. You, you see what I'm saying? And I feel, I, mean, I feel like this started years and years ago when we, when we gave everybody a trophy. Everybody gets that a was, trophy. that was my exact thought when you said what you said, cause that that's how it was for like, I, I remember back in high school, man, and I don't know if every high school was like this. We had the most sports had tryouts except for our football team. If you wanted to play football, you were just on the team. I didn't mean you were going to play. If you didn't play, a lot of the parents would like, you know, get mad about that. But it's like, again, the, I mean, if you want to win the game, are you not going to put your best players in the game? Like, I don't understand how else this is going to work. But yeah, yeah I mean, you, you're exactly right. Because I remember, I remember back as a child, you know, a kid, yeah, everybody was just given a trophy. Didn't matter if you won, lost, how well you did. I mean, everybody's given a trophy. And I understand, you know, I understand that there's a way to motivate children and there's a way to, to motivate adults. I understand the difference. You know, in martial arts, there are way, most of, most martial arts, there's more belts given to a child to, to motivate them to continue to progress versus like in adults, there's, there's not as many belts. And so I understand that. But like, it's, yeah, we have to think on the long term. How does this, what does this do? Like in the long term, does like, what does this, what damage, so to speak, does this cause in the long term? And I think, I don't think that was ever asked basically. No. And I think, and this is just me kind of thinking intuitively what it does is it doesn't elevate people up to the higher standard. Mm -hmm. It brings people down to the lower standard, right? Yep. Because if I am super competitive, but I know everyone's getting a trophy, well, then why would I try harder? Mm -hmm. Why would I try to do my best? Because everyone's going to get the same thing. Yeah. But here's the thing. If you do try your best, look how far ahead that's going to put you because, you know, the bar is set so low. Like, this is the thing. The bar is set so low these days for anything. Like people, people... <laughs> A lot of times people barely do any effort for anything. So if you just give your best, like you're going to, you're going to, if you give your best at a company and the company is worth you giving your time to, they're going to see that and you're going to be rewarded for that. You're going to get the promotions, you're going to get the raises, you're going to get whatever. And if they're not, and if you're giving your best, if you're actually giving your best and you're giving the best to this company, then you have a skill, you have, you have value there that you can go and provide to someone else who is going to see that. Because I do know that there, unfortunately, there are companies and employers who don't see that. And I, I know that's a, that's a thing too. But I was going to say something. You're talking about giving out the trophies. What did you say? The bar, you didn't say the bar was low. You said the expectation. What did you say? Well, I think it doesn't raise people's skills. Oh, I yeah. think it suppresses them. Yeah. So, and that's another thing too I talk about is you see like a very simple way to say that what I talk about is skipping the process and a very simple way to, a very simple example of this is, I'm sure we all heard, we've all heard about somebody winning the lottery. The next year they're broke again. And the reason is because they do not become the person who can handle 
10 million, 50 million, hundred million dollars, whatever it is. And then there it's, it's not, a, it's not a, it's not a life thing. It's a, it's a mind thing. And this is why like poverty is a mindset thing. That's what it is. But it's like the reason that happens is because these people don't become the person who can handle it. And it's the same thing with everything else. It's the same thing. Like if you expect that you're just going to go and I look, I, I don't have any issues with college. Okay. I understand college is important. We need people to go to college. But like, if you just, if you just think that you're just going to go to college and then jump right into the senior role of whatever company you're going to go to, it doesn't work that way because you don't become the per, if you skip the process of anything, fitness, money, degree, career, whatever it is, if you skip the process, you skip the process of becoming the person who can handle that role. And I, I, I think it's just as real. I think it really is that simple because just think about fitness. Just say if a person is 50 pounds overweight, okay, yes, they could take some magic pill that's going to make them lose the weight. And that's another thing too, man. This immediate gratification thing is that something has to happen right now. I mean, it is, it is almost like it's infectious to have that, that sort of thinking because that just, it just permeates everything in your life. But it, if you just try to skip the process and just be that person who is already 50 pounds lighter than what you want to be, if you skip all that, what well, probably if you try to skip it, you're going to injure yourself. And then what that means is you're going to, okay, well now you're injured. Now you can't go to the gym. So just forget about fitness. Right? So it's like it, it's skipping the process of anything is not, is, is going to take you in the opposite direction of being the person who can handle that end goal, whatever it is, you know? Yeah. hundred percent. And my generation didn't, wasn't raised that way. I really mm -hmm. think this started with technology, right? Instant result with no effort. Google yep. instant result with no effort. Mm -hmm. Also, the dot com era, instant millionaires overnight, really no effort. All of a mm -hmm. sudden, we're millionaires. Microwave, instant hot food, no effort. Mm -hmm. So those three things, I think, were the pivotal changes on a societal level that changed this mentality. I would, will go and speak at my sister's college to the kinesiology students, and they think they're going to walk out of there making 100 grand. And I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> how are you going to do that? Right. Right. Or I want to do what you do. Great. 27 years. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not doing what I do today, what I did the first day. Like, but you're mm -hmm. right. We have this desire for that instant gratification because we see it. We see the influencer on yep. Instagram. We see the after pictures, right? We see the before and the after. We didn't see all the hard work and sacrifice mm -hmm. that went into the after. So we just want this outcome. But I have always believed and will tell everybody this, that you do not value what you do not work for. Right. Rarely. Some people will value what's given to them. Some. You will never value it as much as if you worked hard for it ever. Mm -hmm. And it, because we can have things immediately, then that's the easy, right? It's that easy thing in the moment. But those easy things in the moment are very fleeting. Easy come, easy go. I mean, that's not a cliche for no reason. <laughs> yeah. It's because it's real. So let's talk about your fitness journey. I think you said at 27, you decided to go on one. Was fitness, athletics, was that not really part of your upbringing? And why at 27 did we introduce this? <sighs> So why at 27 is a good question, but as a teenager, I was very, I was, I was always into fitness as a teenager, not, not to the degree that I am now, but I probably stopped working out consistently. I don't know, somewhere around 18, 19, somewhere around that, that time frame. picked back up literally almost a decade later. Why is a good question. I was, so I was not overweight. I was not like, you know, trying to lose weight. I was actually a lean guy who was trying to put on muscle. That was, that was sort of my journey. And I think it was just, I had a. I had a, a goal, a, a body that I wanted to embody and I, I had a, a body I wanted to build. So that's, I think that's where it came from, but you know, I didn't know this at the time, but fitness is, is such a, it is such a much more powerful tool than just building a physically fit body. I mean, it, fitness has helped me. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the gym and I've been, you know, negotiating a huge for us, a huge business deal. And I just I, like the, the hours before that during the business day, because I mostly work out at night, the hours before that during the business day, I just could not find the words to, to type in the email. And then I'm in just, I'm, I'm in the gym, man. I, I'm usually in the gym around an hour. And so I'm in there like 30 minutes into it. I'm at the peak of the workout. And it just like, I'm, I'm in this flow. I know that sounds cliche, but just this flow state, you know, it's just like this, like I, I did, I did a workout. I actually did a workout before this podcast, like an hour or so before this podcast. And so I, I was just in this state and it's just like, I can think so much more clearly. And also too, 
is is overcoming that daily. I don't want to call it a struggle because I don't see the gym as a struggle for me. Although I do overcome what I feel like is a daily struggle, which is a cold plunge. I do a forty five degree cold plunge for three minutes, which and that thing, man, that thing sucks. It's like overcoming that, like like I was talking about earlier, building the self confidence, keeping that consistency with yourself, and it's just. I, the fitness is just a very small benefit. It's not a small benefit, but it's it's a small portion of the pie that I think that that comes with that. Yeah, I think I think it was just about you know having this this end goal that I want to have. And fitness is not really an end goal, but it's it's about it was about building this body and being this person. And you know, like I said, I was a lean guy and I wanted to put on the muscle and that kind of thing. And as far as I know, I've I've always been natural. I mean, I take supplements and things, but I've never you know injected anything. And it's crazy too. We were talking about immediate gratification. I actually put, so I'm in a, in a couple of Facebook groups about fitness and gym and that kind of thing. And I put the four year mark, which is in January, I put a picture of like before and after, and I put, you know, January, 2020, January, 2024. And it, it was, it was crazy, but I remember, I will never forget this. This guy commented on there. He was like four years, but it took four years there. He was like, it took four years. I'm like, what do you expect, man? You want this to be a year? Like, is, is this a year long thing? I don't know, whatever. But yeah, no, I just had a, I just had a body that I wanted to build. I had a person that I wanted to be and fitness was, fitness was part of that. You know, I think a lot of people embark on a fitness journey for one reason, usually has something to do with their aesthetic. And then they realize all of the other incredible benefits. We've been talking so much about the mental health benefits of fitness lately. Mm -hmm. And I love that we're seeing a shift in even the initial reason people embark on fitness. It is for their mental health. And, you know, that clarity that you get, I mean, it's because we're getting extra oxygen, blood, nutrition to the brain so we can think. Mm -hmm. And because we're disconnected and we're in different environment and we're doing something physical, which actually does stimulate your brain to have clarity and be creative. I get a lot of my creativity done when I'm out for a walk or when I'm at the gym, I always have my phone to take notes about what I just thought about because I need to go you know, do that later. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, I think so much other work is being done in the gym. And then of course, there's all the physical health benefits of it. So anybody who has yet to embark on a fitness journey, I mean, I talk about that all the time on this podcast, and it still is such an obstacle for people to embrace. And you know, I think even like your generation and younger, we still are seeing so men, so much inactivity. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know how, how to help people really understand that this, it, it's a critical, critical component to your ultimate health and happiness and productivity. Mm -hmm. When you look at your generation younger around there, like, what is the perception of fitness is like, oh, you're just a meathead or, oh, you know, it is all about weight loss or looking a certain way. Like, what is the perception of exercise with people in, in your generation? You know, I'm going to be completely honest, man. I try very hard to not put myself in that space <laughs> because I, I try to not put myself in environments that I feel like is going to have a negative effect on my mental state. And this is one thing we're talking about all the benefits of fitness. This is one of the things of fitness that I talk about all the time is that when you start a fitness program, yes, you start to filter your diet. You start to eat better, drink better, that kind of thing. But like what we don't think about that I think happens as a byproduct of that is you also like once you start to filter what you eat and drink, at some point, you're also going to filter the information that you consume, the energy that you're around, the negative, you know, the negativity or, or, or positivity, the vibes, just the general vibes that you're around with people that you're going to start filtering all these things out because you're taking better care of your body. I think the typical just opinion, I guess, about fitness from people that maybe are not into that space is I think that they think this is sort of an arrogant thing, you know, it's sort of a selfish thing because, you know, ah, you're spending a lot of time in the gym and I, I don't know. I, I mean, it's hard for me to think like what a person might think of, because I, I remember back like before I started working out, like what did I think about a person that was, that was into that? I, I think for me, there was actually a sense of jealousy, but that was just because I wanted to be that myself. Like I wanted to be in the gym, but I just was not there. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm sure it's, there's a spectrum of what people think and but I, I know that probably self. I would be. I would we be willing to bet that selfishness and arrogance and and overly confident is probably a, a, a very common label that people put on on that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, that's interesting from a male's perspective because I think from I know a lot of females that I work with, they're maybe intimidated by it, or mm. you know they don't have the energy to go do it, or they don't. They're not comfortable 
being in a gym or not confident doing things because they don't know how to do it because they didn't grow up doing sports, don't have that body awareness. So I, that's interesting. I, I would not have thought of that. But yeah, I bet that is part of it. What about like just this generation, this your, not generation, but the age, the cohorts and you know, the diet and alcohol practices. I know when I was your age and younger, right? It was eat and drink whatever you want, live the party mm -hmm. life. And, and that's what we do. Where are you with that? Where are your friends with that? Where do you see your generation going with that? I think most people that I know that are, that are my age, you know, around 30-ish, they either have sort of moved past the stage of, you know, going out every weekend and that kind of thing, or they're that that just seems to be something that they just enjoy doing and it's not it's not going to change. And I don't mean to be disrespectful when I say that. It's just I feel like most people if they're still if they're still kind of in that nightlife scene at 30, I, I don't I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. There's not I don't know if there's anything that you can say about that. But the early 20s, mid 20s, of course, I, I mean, I was went through a period where I was, in you know, in the nightclubs. That was before I started working out for sure. Not nightclubs, but you know, the, the weekend drinking, that kind of thing. But I don't know, man. I feel like, I feel like there's so much about like the alcohol and the, and the, the unhealthy eating and the drugs and that kind of thing. There's so much that I feel like there's obviously something there because it's so, it's so big of an issue. I mean, p people way past 30 still have a, a problem with these. Like people all over their life have a problem with these. And I, I don't know. There's clearly something there because it's so big of an issue. And I think it's, I've talked to people in the past and there seems to be a general I guess, consensus, maybe that one of the things that pushes people into this direction is an inability to handle emotions. You know, they, they want to be, I guess, maybe comfortable with the moment or okay with the moment, or there's something happening in their life that is not okay. And they want to be okay. And alcohol and drugs is just a very, that, that just seems to be a very wide under, like broadly understood way that this happens. I mean, there's all, there's all different kinds of addictions. I mean, we, there's phone addiction, sugar addictions. I mean, there's all kinds of different things, you know, sleeping. I mean, people, so there's all different things, but yeah, I think, I don't know if that answers your question or not. No, it did. I think I th what I see just again, kind of looking back and I, I've been out of the party scene for a long time, like many, many, many years ago, I decided I'd rather eat my calories than drink my calories. It's right. just not my thing and did yeah. plenty of it and don't need to do it anymore. But I go back and think about like when I was in my twenties, had I been that girl who was like, I don't drink, mm -hmm. you would have been ostracized from the group, the weird one, not invited to anything like, well, what's wrong with you? Right now, I think there is a lot of more acceptance if somebody chooses not to drink. You don't have to be an alcoholic and that's why I don't drink. You just choose not to drink. It's just not your thing. Or you recognize that it's like a gateway behavior to other things that aren't great. So you'd rather mm -hmm. not do that. Or you are prioritizing your health and your fitness and your productivity and all the things. And you recognize that alcohol does not help you with any of those things. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's much more socially acceptable now for people in their 20s and 30s to choose not to drink. And I don't know if, if that's something that you see like living in that generation, if you see that or not. Well, I think for me, for my personal situation, you know, the people that I was spending time with in that part of my life, we, I mean, I, I still, I'll speak to them every once in a while if I see them, but you know, we just kind of parted ways. And I think that when people say that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, that is absolutely 100% true. And I think that if you're in a friend group and you choose not to drink and somebody makes you feel excluded for that, then you need to consider these people's role in your life because whatever reason it is that you don't want to drink, that's, that's sort of irrelevant. If these people are sort of pushing you in this direction and that's, and you're clearly not happy with that, that you need to have a self a, a discussion with yourself about that. And you need to, I would say, put yourself in an environment that is going to be uh, more conducive to your personal growth and your progress along whatever path you choose to take in life. It's crazy. I was, I was talking to a guy about a week ago. He follows my podcast and everything. And he's, he was actually sort of intoxicated when we were talking. It was clear that this person was not okay with this environment and he was trying to improve his life. And he's like, Oh yeah, my friends, you know, X, Y, Z. And I'm like, dude, but are these like, are these really your friends? You know what I mean? Like, are, I mean, cause look, it's, it is so easy. I'm sure you know this, any person who's started a business or done anything uh, that's sort of outside of what people think they should do with their life, any sort of progress, 
it's very easy for people to look at something that we're doing and say, why are you doing that? Like, who, who the hell are you to be doing this? Like, why do you think you're, you're capable of this? And I think it's very simple. I think the reason that people do that is because it shines a light on the fact they're not doing the same thing for themselves. I think anytime you improve yourself or try to improve yourself and people make you feel like you should not be doing that, I think it's very clear that they want subconsciously, whether they know it or not, they want to be doing something for themselves that they're not doing. So they want to make you feel bad about, you know, bringing you back down to where you should be, quote unquote. But I don't know, you just, you really have to consider these people's role in your life if you don't want to drink or if you don't want to do the drugs, you want to do whatever. And they're making you feel bad about that. I don't, I don't think that's, I think that should be a major red flag. Absolutely. And the sooner uh, in life that you recognize those red flags, the better your life is going to be. <laughs> and sometimes it's really hard to see those red flags. Let's, before we wrap up, I would love to hear, I think you mentioned a couple of relationship situations. Mm -hmm. So I think for anybody, right, breakups, relationships, being in them are challenging. I don't know that I ever really get to hear the side from like the man's perspective. I'm always, you know, hearing it from the girlfriend. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your own experiences and the things that you've learned through those relationships. Man, this is <laughs> probably gonna, a whole other podcast. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm going to try to be as, I'm going to try to be as, as short in this as much as possible. I think, you know, in, in my situation, man, I think I didn't realize it in the moment, but I think what my issue was is that I was with women who were sort of on the same path I was as far as, you know, be as operating from a very masculine frame. There's this whole, it seems like a debate and a controversy about masculine and feminine and, and the traditional man woman relationship and all this kind of stuff. And then everything's changing and all those things are going on. But I just, I think what a lot of women really underestimate is the power of just raw feminine energy that that has on a man, you know, most, some men, I won't say all, I won't say most, I'm just saying some, you know, and I think it's, I think the, I think the importance is to find a person that you are going to energetically vibe with. And I think that vibe is going to be opposite directions. You know, I, th I don't think you can have a person, man or woman, who is, who is very strong in the feminine energy. I don't think you're going to have two people in feminine energy that's going to have of a fulfilling relationship. Cause I think the beauty of it is of man and woman, the beauty of it is that they, they, they coexist in harmony because of the differences. I think that's the beauty of the relationship. And I'm not saying this, I'm not saying it's wrong for a man to operate from a feminine frame and a woman from a masculine frame. But I'm just saying, if you are a person who is in one frame or the other, I think you're going to have a much more fulfilling relationship. If you're with a person who makes up for your differences, basically. And I think that was, that, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was what my issue, I think that's why these relationships were so combative, I guess. Like we just didn't, we, we couldn't get along or whatever. But I'll say this, like, so, and I, I'll, I'll just say, I'll just say it. I mean, there seems to be a lot of guys these days who are not stepping up to the plate. So I do not blame most women whatsoever for trying to take on that masculine frame being that masculine role because a lot of these a lot of these younger guys are just simply not stepping up i mean if i was a woman i wouldn't i wouldn't trust these people like it's like it's crazy because we, we sit here we as men sit here and we say oh well i want to i want a, a woman who will let me lead and who will let me do this and it's like bro do, would you even trust yourself to let you lead like what are you doing for yourself like you expect this person to just trust you and be okay with this and it's like what, what are you doing for yourself that's going to make you competent enough to be able to do this and this is go, goes back to that immediate gratification thing, man. It's like for for whatever reason, these guys don't seem like this is something like they just they just want this thing, and just because they want it, it's going to happen. Like I, I, it doesn't work that way, man. I don't think it works that way. It's it's, it's not. I, in fact, I know it doesn't work that way. No, uh, yeah. I I think that's great. I think it's a great thing to at least think about. And again, it goes kind of to these roles that exist now. That you know, 1950s, 60s, right? They didn't exist. We had very mm -hmm. clearly defined roles. Mm -hmm. My my friend who I was just with her, she said her mom said to her when she had her, her first kid, aren't you so glad about the feminist movement? Now you can work two full-time jobs, <laughs> right? right? She's a career woman and she's raising a child, even though she has a husband, right? But, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's kind of what it did, right? Like, look at us, we're so liberated. And, and yet now we're doing all the things. Mm -hmm. And so the roles have become very blurry because we can take care of ourselves. Now, mm -hmm. again, it makes maybe some men feel like, well, I'm not needed because you can take care of yourself. So if I'm not needed because you can take care of yourself, then I don't, why do I don't need to step up? 
or mm-hmm. I now don't feel like I have value or purpose. And even if that's not an overt acknowledgement or feeling, it is back there mm-hmm. for sure. And I think those are some of the big challenges that, that couples definitely do face or why people stay single. I have friends tell me all the time, Michelle, you need to date. I'm like, great, line them up for me. They're like, yeah, I don't know anyone. I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, my criteria I- is not, okay, here's my criteria. My friends love this. It's very simple. Mm-hmm. Interesting, interested, available. Mm. That's the first layer of criteria. So far in the last 12 years, I've met zero who were interesting, interested, and available, all three. Zero. Hmm. If they make it past that, then there's second tier, financially stable, Mm -hmm. emotionally intelligent, physically fit, Mm -hmm. and mentally sound. I am all of those things. I want my partner to be all of those things. They might not be identical or exactly the same, but you got at my age, I'm 51. You need to be all those things by now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm afraid if I, not afraid because whatever, but if I find someone who makes it past the first tier, Mm -hmm. that second tier is tough because so many men don't do their work. They don't learn their lessons like you clearly are, are doing as a very young man. Mm-hmm. But so many men to my age, right? They just go from one thing to the next. They're victims. They're this. They've been wronged. It's all the things. And they carry all of that baggage into their next thing. Yep. And a lot of people like me don't want that baggage because we're not carrying that baggage. We've done our work. You need to have done your work. So mm-hmm. there, I know 10 of me. I know 10 women just like me. And we're all in the same boat, right? And this becomes a big issue why there are so many people who are not in high quality, solid relationships because Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take on something that, no, thank you. I don't need to do that anymore. And I look at like the younger generations, like you said, men not stepping up or not doing the work of their emotional growth and women too. women do Mm -hmm. the same thing, right? They got their stuff and sometimes they don't do their work and all the things. So that's the thing is it takes, it takes both players to be equally invested. And that's also very hard to find. Mm -hmm. So I think you made a really good point. You said that, you know, 10 of you who are looking for the same type of man. And this is what I try to tell men, like, just become that man, like, like grow, you know, improve yourself men (laughs) across every area of their life for all generations ever, like in in a total span of human time have spent so many mental, physical and emotional and financial resources trying to find the right woman, trying to chase the right woman. And I wish one thing that I, I can't even say that because I'm thankful for the relationships and the, the experiences I had in my twenties, because they taught me things. They taught me things about myself. And, but I, but I just, I just, I wish somebody would have told me how, how much chasing women will probably not get you the right one. (laughs) I mean, just, I'm not saying you can never chase women. I'm saying focus on yourself, improve yourself first. And then once you get to a place where maybe you think you're somewhat capable of handling this, then you can chase it. But it's like, it's like you just said, like, you know, 10 of you who are looking for the same man who seems to not exist. And it's like, what I would tell men is like, become that man, like do whatever it is. It's going to make you grow and progress across your, your evolution of life. Because look, here's the deal as, and I can't speak for women, but as a man, I can't even say that because I feel much better at 30 than I ever did at 20. But people say that you have much more energy and vibrance and whatever in your twenties, use that to do something productive, man, build a business, build your, build a physical body. I mean, I didn't start, I didn't start working out until I was 27. And I feel like people tell me all the time that I look, you know, good to be 30 or whatever that means. But it's like, it's like, dude, you have, there, there is a decade here that you can use to progress your life. Like you got plenty of time for these other things. And I just feel like if most men were to focus on becoming better parts of themselves, I mean, at least, at least whatever we as men contribute to society, the worst case scenario is that whatever it is that men bring to society, we could do that much better if everybody would focus on, if every man would focus on being better men. I'm not in no way, shape or form saying that every relationship is the man's fault or anything, but I'm saying if you focus on yourself as, because look, you can't provide for a woman, you can't provide for a family, you can't protect. How do you think you're going to do that if you're not first the best version of yourself? 
I mean, you, you simply cannot. I don't know what, like, there's no way, I don't know what else to say about that. You know, you can't, it sounds so cliche, but you can't pour from an empty cup. You know, you can only be so much to somebody to the degree that you can let yourself grow as a person. Yeah, I love it. Cody, I feel like I could talk to you forever. We're going to probably have to have you back to cover some other things, but this has been a super fun conversation. I know we were all over the place. I'm sure the sure. listeners have a little bit of whiplash, but you know what? It's cool. You're fine. You can get over your whiplash. I'm good with it. Anything before we officially wrap up that you want to share that we haven't covered today? Not anything that's going to result in another tangent. So maybe we should wait till next time. Perfect. You have a great podcast. You have ways to connect. We'll make sure to put all of that in the show notes. Yeah, I just, I loved your energy. I knew it was going to be a great conversation. And listeners, I know you got a bunch of nuggets in there. Pick one and run with it and you get to go and be a better being. Thank you for listening to the Be A Better Being podcast. Michelle and Sasha hope that what you heard today inspires you to embrace this journey of life with an open mind, a kind heart, and a willingness to learn and evolve. If you enjoyed the content, please help spread their message by subscribing, sharing, and leaving a five-star review. If you have a show topic idea or would like to be a guest, please visit betterbeings.net and fill out a contact form. Until next time, go and be a better being.